My name is Stephen Chambers. I'm Managing Director here at IndieBio. Like I've got two missions from today. Okay, first mission is kind of give you a sneak peek on our latest IndieBio cohort, Cohort 5. I'm Lana Last, co-founder and CEO of Emma. We have a patent pending formulation that uses CBD and CBG and one other active ingredient with proven pain relieving efficacy. Hi, I'm Vanita Tripathi, founding CEO and CSO of Vitarka Therapeutics, where we are developing Endopore to unlock the power of RNA therapeutics. I'm Gregory, the CEO of Flosphere, the company that is going to change the way we discover new drugs. My name is Trey. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Vader, where we screen for naturally occurring microorganisms that have the ability to break down environmental contaminants. My name is Tomas Silicaro. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Biotectics, and we are revolutionizing the solvents industry by turning it into a natural, biodegradable and sustainable one at a cost-effective price. My name is Martin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Biofluff. Biofluff is a performance material company that is changing the way things are made. I'm Kathleen Heffron, founder and CEO of Forte Protein, and we are going to change the future of food. Hello everyone, I'm Bianca, co-founder and CEO of Edge, where we're creating a platform technology to mass produce the most authentic and affordable growth factors. My name is Doug Grant, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Atlantic Fish Co. We're using cellular agriculture to develop the world's first cultivated halibut. The other is to sort of launch this amazing space that we have here uh, at Seven Pen Plaza. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been here before, but we're immensely proud of this space uh, and the opportunity that it brings uh, to sort of nucleate uh, the life science ecosystem in New York. You're always welcome. Okay, without further ado. So three years ago uh, was the first period I had where I couldn't take any Advil or Tylenol. I had taken Advil or Tylenol so long to um, manage my period pain that I developed ulcers. I was throwing up with a migraine. I had stomach pain, abdominal pain, and pretty bad uh, nerve pain in my legs. So I couldn't find any relief. I needed to find a solution. I needed to find something because my quality of life was so low every month. In a study done in 2018, over 30% of menstruators did not find NSAIDs working for their period pain. Said in another way, that's a third of menstruators who did not respond to the standard care. So why don't other treatment options exist? Emma is filling this gap by creating CBD-based alternative period solutions. CBD and CBG are non-psychoactive cannabinoids with clinically validated anti-inflammatory, analgesic, and neuroprotective effects. It has studies showing that it helps with endometriosis, a severe type of period pain, it restores the endocannabinoid balance in the vagina, a system that naturally occurs within us and that can create this period pain, and it's 30 times stronger than aspirin without any of the side effects, which is why we're using it in our formulation. At Emma, we have a patent-pending formulation that uses CBD and CBG and one other active ingredient with proven pain-relieving efficacy. Our first product, OV Relief, is a vaginal suppository that locally delivers these agents to the vagina and uterus for a safe and effective period pain solution. And we're launching this May of 2023. OV Relief characterization showed superiority over our competitors. For example, in vaginal pH, we actually preserve it whereas our competitors push that to neutral, which can cause urinary tract infections, BV, and yeast infections. And OV is water soluble and stable at room temperature, while our oil-based competitors need refrigeration. 
In our in vitro data study, we found that there's an initial burst followed by a sustained release of these active agents so that there's fast and long lasting relief for the user. We're doing a product efficacy trial with the Physician CBD Council and what we found has been amazing. Over 80% of users have found total relief from their period pain. Think about that, total relief. What we also found is that it takes 30 to 45 minutes to work, lasts seven to nine hours, there's no adverse effects, and there's even improved benefits from sleep to decretion in nausea and migraines. It's a whole body solution for a whole body problem. So the challenge has been trying to um, explain to investors that this is a billion dollar problem. Half of the planet has this issue. And so we hope that you join us to empower 80 million North American menstruators to manage their period pain with freedom and dignity. And if you're a man and you wanna experience this pain, please come to our booth. We have a leaderboard going to see who can handle it. Thank you. mRNA vaccines have reignited the belief in RNA therapeutics. And yet, don't be shocked when I tell you that one in six of us will die because of cancer. Yes, one in six of us will die. We have managed to avoid the pandemic, but we cannot escape cancer because 85% of late-stage solid tumors go untreated. RNA therapeutics can change this by targeting 90% of the proteome, which is currently undruggable by antibodies or small molecules. However, we are not achieving this. It's not translating to clinic. Why? Because of two problems. Existing non-viral delivery technologies cannot target the tumors. These get absorbed in the liver and excreted out of the body. The second problem is endosomal entrapment. The little that does reach the tumor cell gets trapped within a subcellular compartment known as the endosome, and therefore it never reaches the target mRNA. Hi, I'm Vanita Tripathi, founding CEO and CSO of Vitarka Therapeutics, where we are developing Endopore to unlock the power of RNA therapeutics. Endopore is engineered from pore forming proteins which have a naturally evolved mechanism of endosomal escape. Endopore guides the RNA to a specific cell surface receptor which is overexpressed on tumor cells. Once it then gets endocytose, it forms a pore within the endosomal membrane to release the RNA therapeutic into the cytosol. Our cell-based data in a Petri dish demonstrates that up to 80% of the RNA is released into the cytosol. Comparing this with the less than 1% delivered by a nanoparticle, this is a significant improvement. What you are seeing here is the first of its kind tumor-targeted delivery of siRNA using endopore. The first animal, the tumor was injected with a nanoparticle-based siRNA. It's cleared it by the liver, removed from the body, undetectable after four hours. The second animal was injected with another type of nanoparticle siRNA. It is nonspecific, spreads everywhere in the body, causing toxicity. The third animal is injected with endopore siRNA and it is evident that the siRNA is targeted specifically to the tumors, and it is retained within the tumor for up to 48 hours. I believe that it's the team whose hard work can lead a development plan to fruition, and Vitorka's leadership team has a stellar track record of delivering therapeutics to clinic. Since joining the IndieBio program in the last four months, we have raised $1.5 million 
these funds have already been used for generating data for immunogenicity profiling, off-target binding, and in vivo biodistribution. The key benefit of Endopore is the ease of manufacturing. It is a recombinant protein manufactured using routine protein production processes, which also therefore reduces the cost of manufacturing by almost tenfold as compared to antibody therapeutics. When and not if we are successful, our vision is to take Endopore beyond cancer to other therapeutic areas. I was starting making a PhD in oncology and when I was making my experiments I was quite disappointed by the limitation of the in vitro models that I was using and so I decided to create something much more sophisticated uh, with a multi-tissue uh, system. Today drug discovery is inefficient. We spend more than two billion dollars per drug and more than 10 years of research and development. But why? Because we use in vitro methods and animal models that are poorly predictive and poorly relevant to reflect the human biology. But now, we are assisting to a revolution with new technologies that are coming, like 3D circulation methods to screen a huge amount of compounds, and then we assess the drugs with a more sophisticated method called the human on a chip, where we put several organs on the chip to mimic the organization of the human body. But at Flosphera, we identify a technology gap in between, where we need the relevance of the human on a chip, but with the flexibility and the throughput of 3D circuitry methods. So at Flosphera, we develop a solution using the power of fluorescent light to mimic the organization of the human body. Briefly, we isolate tissues from the human body, like the heart and the liver together, into fluorescent capsules for the recognition of the tissues. Like that, we create liquid microphysiological systems. And then we use fluorescent probes to track the activity of drugs on these communicating tissues. So here we have the liver, here we have the brain, and then we can combine them together to make a liver brain system. We are in a very active uh, space uh, today because uh, organoids, spheroids, this is really uh, active topics today. And uh, we are really different from uh, these uh, competitors because we combine uh, different tissues together. Uh, when we speak about organoids, this is a single uh, type of organoids. Uh, we almost never combine the different types together. So this is a way that we are uh, different and that we are better to predict than the effect of drugs on these kind of systems. We proved already that our technology is working on tamoxifen, a famous drug used against breast cancer that was saving millions of lives. But tamoxifen was discovered by accident because it is not efficient at all in vitro. And why? Because when we test tamoxifen in vitro, we use the breast tissue alone and tamoxifen need to be activated by the liver first. And with our technology, we can combine the liver and the breast together, and we can capture the efficacy of tamoxifen, meaning that we can also discover other drugs like tamoxifen that will save millions of lives. So we target the step of lead optimization. This is a specific step of drug discovery, one of the most important ones, but also the most expensive. First, our solution can be used much earlier compared to chip-based MPS. Thanks to that, we miss less promising compounds, and so we can discover potent drugs for the patients. Then, our technology is very easy to use, so it decreases the barrier of adoption within the market, and it is highly flexible, so we can develop systems for most pharmaceutical applications. Please join us to revolutionize drug discovery with Flosphere. Thank you very much. So now to our uh, founders uh, from our alumni companies. Andrea, if you could give us a, an intro. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I am a 25-year pharma industry veteran. I've brought nine drugs to market. Cayuga Biotech is a drug therapeutics company that harnesses 
the body's innate ability to halt bleeding and heal. So we're truly biomimetic, um, like many of the most successful drugs on the market today. Our first indication is for severe hemorrhage, which kills nearly two million people per year um, and is largely thought to be preventable. Hi everyone, I'm Rohini, co-founder and chief growth officer at Helix. Uh, what we're building at Helix is a next generation gene editing drug design platform um, so that we're able to develop effective and more safer therapeutics for patients with high unmet need. One of the biggest challenges that prevents gene editing from bedside to bedside translation is actually precision of editing and truly understanding the impact or the long-term impact of an editing event. What's unique about what Helix is building is that we are using the 3D spatial organization of the genome and epigenetics to drive drug design. I know it's a lot of complex words, but in essentiality, what it means is all the cells of our body have the same exact DNA, but our eye cells look so very different from our skin cells and liver cells. And that's nature's intelligence. It's the way the DNA is packaged within the cell is different. And we are leveraging these differences to drive precision into gene editing. So SV BioVentures is being created uh, with the specific goal of bringing opportunities to Korean investors, so US-based opportunities to Korean investors, because currently they do not have uh, many such opportunities. So our limited partner base is uh, from Korea. And uh, we also, though, envision being able to help uh, with cross-border kind of transactions in terms of facilitating uh, the transfer of U.S. technologies to the Asian market, and specifically Korea, which is challenging for uh, many companies. And then also, there are limited opportunities for Korean-based technologies to exit that country and address uh, markets, you know, in, uh, more globally. Where do you see your company being, Andrea? Sure. So I will pick a five-year mark because we will be on the market mm -hmm. with our first indication, um, probably our second indication, um, and we will be advancing towards our first goal for our first product of being a broad universal standard of care for anyone with severe bleeding. We will also be close to the clinic, if not um, well into registration trials for our second rare bleeding disorder program and have significantly matured the rest of our pipeline. Awesome. Uh, Rahini, like go for it. Where are you going to be in a couple of years? Uh, to your point, to I you. think very specifically is to actually reach that IND mark with our own indication to start human trials. Uh, but secondly, I think foster a biopharma collaboration wherein with our platform, we're able to actually use it for uh, many other uh, uh, diseases like neurodegeneration. Um, so co-development of uh, potential one and done therapeutics uh, with biopharma partners. Awesome, okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. and. Uh, uh, we're going to crack on now and move on. Okay, thank you. My name is Trey. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Vader, where we screen for naturally occurring microorganisms that have the ability to break down environmental contaminants. The contaminants that we're most focused on are PFAS chemicals. This is a class of compound that contains multiple fluorine bonds and has been used pretty widely in manufacturing since the 1940s. You can find PFAS in anything from your nonstick cooking pans to the rechargeable batteries that we have in all of our devices. Because we've used these chemicals so widely in manufacturing, they've ultimately found their way into our environment, into the food we eat and drink, and ultimately into our bodies. A study showed that 98% of Americans contain PFAS in their blood. This has been linked to changes in liver enzymes, birth defects, and multiple forms of cancer. But aside from the fluorine that causes these issues, we know that these molecules are ultimately made of carbon. And if you can find the microorganisms that can use that carbon as a food source, you find the same microorganisms that can break these chemicals down and detoxify them. So what we've been doing is developing a way to screen for that. And this story starts for me um, with an interest in, in understanding how to upcycle. So can we find a way to, to take what we saw going on with PET plastic um, and figure out how to use the microbes that we knew 
could eat PET plastic um, and transform that into something else that might be more valuable. So a way to turn, turn plastic waste into, into something valuable. Um, and that, that was the goal that we started with when we, when we started working at Genstase uh, almost three years ago. Our system uses a combination of wet lab automation, computer vision, image processing, and analytical chemistry. Our goal is not simply to find a single needle in a haystack, but instead to continuously select the right microorganisms and through multiple iterations of screening, drive a population to be able to degrade a given target, all the while monitoring our progress via analytical chemistry. Our business model is a licensing approach, where we leverage our expertise in screening and identifying these strains, and we work with the groups and license the groups who can remediate contamination or manage PFAS waste. In order to commercialize these organisms, we're utilizing well-established trap and treat methodology within the remediation space. But aside from this initial beachhead, we know that the opportunities for PFAS solutions are substantial. Within the US alone, we see a total addressable market of over $100 billion, a serviceable available market of $6 billion, and a potential obtainable market of over $800 million. So we think with starting with our beachhead in PFAS, ultimately we can expand out to other contaminants also made of carbon, like PCBs or plastics in the future. But we're starting with PFAS because we know this problem is urgent. It exists here in New York, but not only that, because if we don't do something about this problem that exists within our clothing, within our cookware, and within all of our devices, it will not just persist, but it will continue to grow. So it's important that we do something about this problem and start making solutions now. So if you continually select the best microbes and you expand um, from that microbe set um, and then you, you screen against that new set and you select the best there and you, you, continue, to, you continue to iterate on that process, you can almost drive the evolution uh, towards a, a directed set of organisms. And that I think is also a kind of the power of this, of this approach is if you're thinking about this as, as a tool to, to not just screen but also as a tool to develop and optimize organisms. Do you know what these three pictures have in common? Solvents. Solvents are a key additive of many products and industries. We absorb them, we breathe them, we eat them every day. The problem is that they are making us sick and they are damaging the environment. Nowadays, you can find in the market traditional petrochemical solvents that are really toxic, risky to manage, and they generate a lot of dangerous waste. Several years ago, biosolvents appeared as a greener solution but the truth is that they only change the sustainability and the production process, while the final product is still risky and toxic. Ionic liquids appeared as well as a green solution, but the truth is that they are mainly not natural, and the ones that are, are so expensive that it's impossible to afford them. My name is Tomas Silicaro. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Biotechnics, and we are revolutionizing the solvents industry by turning it into a natural, biodegradable, and sustainable one at a cost-effective price. We are developing the new generation of green solvents using zero petroleum, generating zero metric tons of dangerous waste, and avoiding the exposure of millions of workers to dangerous chemicals. But how do we do this? We use biomimetics to imitate how plants produce their own solvents, and we add eutectic technology. But again, what is the eutectic technology? With eutectic technology, we mix two solid compounds such as sugars, alcohols, organic acids, and many others, that by mixing them in very specific conditions and proportions, their melting point drops dramatically, generating hydrogen bonds that turn these two solids into a super stable liquid. This super stable liquid is our eutectic solvent. But being natural and biodegradable is not enough for us. Our products have amazing additional features. They can be antimicrobial agents, natural preservants, natural stabilizers, among others. But two key facts to highlight is that we can customize our products to meet specific needs of markets or customers, and as well, they will be food grade with the possibility of being pharma grade as well. Nowadays, we have 15 products fully validated with their patents filed that can replace all these products, and all these customers are already trusting us, and we are having conversations with many others. Our business model is clearly B2B. We want to supply solutions and products to the industries. We are now focusing in four main applications. Natural adjuvants for agrotech, basis for cream and gels in personal care and cosmetics, extractions of medicinal plants, colorants, flavors, and many others in food, and solvents to replace amines in gas capture. 
a key part of this is that the total addressable market for solvents is $57 billion. But nine of those are biosolvents and growing on a 40% rate annually. This confirms that a need of a greener solution is already there and even a partial one is working. And this is something additional that we are working a lot. It's in a AI and a machine learning platform that will help us to be more efficient on the development of our products, uh, trying to achieve the way of having a formula, not even testing it first in the, in the lab. But there we can add all the raw materials, all the characteristics we want, and instead of searching by raw materials, we can say, hey, I need a solvent that has this density, this molarity, this viscosity. What should I mix? In which proportions? And the platform will give us five, six different formulas we can test and achieve our goal with one of those ones. All this is really possible because of the dream team that we have. And particularly, Maria Fernanda Silva was named two months ago by Stanford University as one of the 2% most prestigious and influential scientists around the world because of her study in the technology that we use. This is Biotactics from Nature to Life. Thank you very much. Some people say that finding the right investor is like a good marriage. I'll let you be the, uh, the judge of that statement. But before we get there, could you just quickly share your story and explain why grants were an important first step before finding the right partner? Sure. Between, between starting to negotiating our participation in uh, Indie Bio New York and Demo Day, we got about, we got three phase ones and a phase two. And between the angels and Indie Bio, we raised about a half a million dollars. So we had about $2 million at the end of, of Demo Day. And then I get a call from this guy named Andy, who's a fast talker, excitable guy. He says he wants to take this big. It's really exciting. We're in the middle of a pandemic. You're going to do something about it. So we want to, you know, push forward. And I thought, we're not really ready. We're not going to be able to, to keep the value creation going. We have to do some of our own research first. So I basically, using the marriage analogy, I was single. <laughs> Marrying money is like a full-time job. So I thought, tell you what, I didn't say let's be friends. What I said was, how about we do like a long distance, low key courtship? I love that. It's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and I can, you can say that you are quite a prodigious uh, applicant of grants. You're the king of grants, in my opinion. Um, now, Andy, you're, you've been long involved in deep tech. What first brought you here? And uh, you know, how did you first kind of like come across Halomine and Andy Bio? Great question, great question. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I was a bit of a fan of, of, of Indie Bio and by extension SOSV for, for some time. And so I'm, I'm proud to report that I actually came across Halomine at, uh, at an Indie Bio demo day. And, um, and again, you know, our, our focus is on finding technologies with this kind of outsized impact potential. And um, you know, tuning into the, the demo day at the time, I uh, you know, saw Ted speak and was blown away. And um, yeah, one thing led to another. And, and uh, you know, happily married and uh, things, are, things are going great. Ted and Andy, can you tell us a little bit more about the fundraising process? I mean, Andy, you, it seems that you run a, a kind of a, a SPV type fund, right? Correct. Where you have to raise the money on the back end of each deal that you do. How did that play out in your dynamic? And Ted, were you involved side by side in the fundraising process with Andy, with his limited partners? Yes, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kick that off because this is a funny, funny nuance to Blue Ledge Capital. Uh, most of my peers have funds, which which makes the the actual investment part pretty pretty seamless. Um, I get the joy of going out and having the exact same call a hundred different times with a hundred different investors, um, which then have their own kind of critiques and perspectives. Um, as much as it's a bane of my existence, sometimes it's, it's actually very creative because it does. Uh, I hate this term, but I call it kind of decentralized VC because I get a lot of questions and, and things like that from my network that you wouldn't ordinarily get from a typical VC firm. Um, it's almost like I have 100 GPs behind me that, that kind of participate. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's, you know, a lot of investors want to keep it really simple. They want to hear a narrative. They want to hear a story about how there's a need and this fits that need. And they do not want to learn about the electronegativity of chlorine or oxidation potential or how chlorine works in water or any of that. Uh, literally, they hate it. Um, so it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like threading that needle, and I think that you know, certainly to, to founders here raising capital, it's, it's, it's really reading your, reading your audience and understanding some folks want to dig in, some folks want to dig in quicker than others, um, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wild ride. The first time I was exposed to fur was actually when working for a Bay Area startup called Microworks, and they sent me to Europe 
to work on their mushroom leather with their European clients. That was when I first saw fur animals being processed in a tannery, and it just struck me. I was like, how is there no good solution to replace this material? The states of California and New York have both banned the import and the wholesale of animal fur at the beginning of this year. The only available replacement is polyester or acrylic-based plastic fur. Both materials, animal fur as well as plastic fur, are doing more harm to our planet than necessary. This is an opportunity. We have discovered a way to turn naturally existing plant fibers into an alternative to fur. And it comes, of course, from nature. People are always blown away by how much our material looks and feels like animal fur. That's because like animal fur, it was grown. It's organic, it's durable. It holds up to industrial sewing and fabrication techniques. And mechanical tests show that our fibers outperform keratin-based animal hair and polyester-based fiber in tensile strength tests. It's engineerable. We have already created a nearly endless range of colors, patterns, structures, and insulation properties. And all this, we want to empower fashion designers to think beyond what's currently possible with animal and plastic fur, and to reimagine the world with plant-based fur. When we first started here at IndieBio, we had produced a piece that was one square foot. Within one month, we had produced a piece that was two by three feet. And within three months, we had developed an industrial process to manufacture this material by the yard. That's 15 mink saved right there. We're scaling, and we're scaling fast. We can do this because we're using drop-in solutions to existing industries. And we're already able to produce more than 15,000 square foot per day without owning a single manufacturing plant. Best of all, due to the high price point of animal fur, we're able to compete with this material today we're currently producing biofluff in our manufacturing site in Italy for about $5 per square foot. We're pricing it at 20. Everyone in here can do the math. We cannot disclose names, but we're currently working with five different European luxury brands with a total combined annual sales of over $55 million. What we can disclose on the other hand is that we got nominated for the LVMH award last year and we're now part of the world's most prestigious and most luxurious incubator program in Paris. The reason why Biofluff got nominated is probably because fur is lagging behind, it's lagging behind all the other biomaterials that are developed. It's lagging behind leather, silk, behind wool, behind all the, all the other animal-based products because of its innate properties. Makes it um, a little bit harder, technically more challenging, but with the technology on hand, we are absolutely certain that we will create a product that's living up to its customers' expectations. Last year, humanity carbon emissions reached 36 gigatons of CO2 in the atmosphere. And if we are continuing with that pace, green indeed will be the rarest color. The problem is simple. We are not in symbiotic relationship with our planet anymore. And that relationship must be restored. Ironically, nature holds an obvious solution. It's photosynthesis. But natural photosynthesis cannot keep up with our pace. It needs help. I am Spas, the CEO of Pneuma, and we are bringing engineered photosynthesis across the world through the power of microalgae. We captured that power and immense carbon fixation capacity into a textile fiber. Let me show you. 
We have developed a proprietary technology that produces engineered living biomaterials. Entirely biodegradable, actively photosynthesizing, living and breathing textiles. The first fiber we made wasn't an ordinary one. It was the first carbon capturing fiber called Oxia. Allow me to present it here. It's a small piece compared to Martin's, but it holds, <laughs> but it holds 500 meters of fiber here. And it has the capacity to capture 2.4 ml of CO2 per day. It may sound really tiny, but now imagine covering the whole room with it. And now imagine 10 million rooms around the world with that material. With over a year, it will be able to capture up to 1% of all those 36 gigatons of CO2 I mentioned. And to back it up with some data, I'm showing you my favorite graph. It's the carbon fixation daily exchange of our fibers monitored in a gas measuring chamber. As you can see, our fibers rapidly consume CO2 from the atmosphere in the beginning of their day phase, and then they continue as a natural photosynthetic cycle. With Oxia, we entered nearly a trillion dollar market, the textile one, where everyone is trying to reduce its carbon footprint. And it doesn't matter if they're doing it because of governmental or societal issues, or just for PR, but they are putting a lot of money in introducing sustainable products in their pipelines. We are currently partnering with companies across all three main sectors in the textile industry, apparel, interiors, and exterior textiles. In a few months, Oxia will be showcased in a fashion show in Paris, in a furniture lounge in Los Angeles, and even on a beach bar here in New York, in Montauk. We are now, even at this stage, having a, a really big commercial interest from fashion and design and architecture industry to use that material. And not, not just because it's uh, part of the sustainable trend, but uh, because they are seeing for the first time, many of them, uh, a material that is alive. So the first question I have is a pretty um, general one, but I think an important one because as you think about spaces like therapeutics or genomics that have been around for a really long time, you know, they are, it's very easy to know what questions they are answering. And so, you know, why biomaterials? This is going to sound bad, but I, I think that imagine a nightmare scenario here where we, where we spend the next 20 years solving for carbon and then we end up, you know, like the beginning of the movie Wall-E, just sort of covered in trash. Because now we have this massive oversupply of really, really low cost inputs that are no longer being burned and they can get turned into materials. Uh, and you just run out of control uh, without actually ever like really solving the fundamental problem, which is about our relationship with nature. So that's like the sort of climate ecological uh, answer to that question. The um, scientific answer, like why is it interesting, right, it is also, uh, there's also a sort of plastics connection, I think, right? If you think about the, the origins of plastics, the early days of plastics, um, these all begin as mimics. They begin as fake ivory and fake tortoiseshell and fake silk um, for the fibers. Uh, but once you get to, uh, you know, DuPont at the World's Fair, they're not selling alternatives to anything anymore. They're selling a new vision of the future, a new set of materials that can do new things. And I think, uh, I think we, we both think that um, Biomaterials are right at this edge, right? There's a whole bunch of reasons why the fundamental nano and microstructure and the physics of biomaterials and the way this uh, is efficient with carbon, uh, is efficient with sort of production processes, and is able to do a lot with a little, sort of from a sophistication perspective, is, is a really fundamental shift. Here, and I'll, I'll chime in. So uh, I come out of the commodities world, so commodities trading. And as you look at kind of the history of, of commodities, and I'll use electricity as a low-hanging fruit here because EVs are such a big deal today. And 
they were also <laughs> expected to be a big deal 20 years ago. It takes time for technology to catch up and develop in a way where it can properly be adopted in a society, right? So if you look at the power industry, same thing with wind and solar, how it was uh, very expensive and you brought that cost curve down. So now that it's cheaper than <clears throat> making power in any other form, really. So you've created this renewable way that's better for the planet and, and that we can use every day. Similarly, uh, you haven't had that kind of disruption. You've had a little bit, let's say in the food space now, you've had a little bit in, say, the with biofuels and the fuel space, but in the plastic space, we really haven't had that kind of disruption yet. But now we're at this point where technology is, is meeting with that and you can use bio, you can create biomaterials that can actually be drop-in replacements for what we use. So looking forward to, to that actually being the future, whether it's biomaterials, recycled uh, products, uh, all of this I, I put in a similar category. You know, and I, I just think that these materials that we use today made of petrochemicals, which the production of is so carbon intensive, so destructive, the chemicals that are used to treat animal products, like I'm looking across and I see a sea of very fashionable people wearing beautiful things. Um, but those things are made of, of, of animal leather that's tanned with chromium. Uh, you know, we're surrounded by paint that's made of petrochemical plastic, TVs, petrochemical plastic, and this stage, most likely, petrochemical plastic. And so the, the scope of what we're able to replace, the scope of what we're trying to do is, is huge, it's massive, and that's in itself a great problem and a great business opportunity, and I think a reason why, both scientifically, it's, it's a pr pursuit worth, worthy, uh, as well as a business one. Thank you for your time. So I uh, started uh, my journey as uh, instructor at uh, Cornell University. I realized that I had a method for uh, producing proteins in plant tissues, and it was uh, a very strong and powerful tool. So what makes Forte Protein better than the other molecular farming companies? Well, let's take a look at how many of them make their proteins right now. Many use a transgenic approach where they introduce the gene encoding the animal protein into the chromosome of a plant and over a period of many months and sometimes years eventually end up with some sort of yield of their protein. Now let's look at Forte Protein's process. Forte Protein inserts our gene of interest into our proprietary vector and then we can actually spray our vector onto the leaves of non-transgenic plants, just regular plants. And in a matter of days, our vector replicates like crazy, and we end up with a very high yield of our protein product. So we have high, high levels of uh, protein being expressed compared to transient expression. And this gives you a, a feel for uh, the different types of molecular farming available today. So we have the transgenic plant uh, method, which is very slow on the far right over there. And then we have uh, transient expression. And then Forte protein, of course, because our vector replicates, has much higher expression, and it's very, very fast. So besides all of these things, this uh, expression system is really a, a, a platform where we can produce all sorts of different proteins in plants. We don't carry any mammalian pathogens. And we don't carry any plant pathogens for that matter because we're in and out of the plant so quickly. We don't need any chemical inputs. We have a low carbon footprint. We can repurpose our plant waste and our products have grass status. So we can supply our proteins to food manufacturers, ingredient providers, nutritional supplement makers, and many others. As I said, this is a platform technology so we can produce all sorts of different proteins. We can even repurpose our waste for other, other products as well. So here are some of the products we have in our pipeline. So take, for example, lactoferrin. This is a high-value protein that is found in milk products. It contains antimicrobial and cancer-fighting activities. It also just happens to carry iron. There are two billion people around the planet today who suffer from anemia and many of them don't eat animal-based products. Imagine if Forte Protein produced a plant-based version of lactoferrin to address iron-deficient populaces, and that is just one of the things that we're going to do.
So I think people need to appreciate the power of plants. We can produce all kinds of things out of plants, you know, where, whether it's uh, industrial products or, or food products, and we just haven't uh, uh, pursued it to its full potential. So I think that, um, you know, what, what I have to offer is just one uh, option of, of where we could potentially go. Hello everyone, I'm Bianca, co-founder and CEO of Edge, where we're creating a platform technology to mass produce the most authentic and affordable growth factors. Now, growth factors are proteins and hormones essential to cell growth. Up until now, they've only been used in the pharmaceutical industry, but as cells make their way into consumer goods through the industries of cultivated meat, cultivated dairy, and innovations in cosmetics, the de demand for growth factors has skyrocketed. The problem is that growth factors are incredibly expensive making between 60 to 80% of the production costs across the board. For reference, one milligram of TGF-beta, a popular growth factor, goes for over $5,000. The average peanut weighs one gram. That means in weight, a peanut is worth over $5 million in TGF-beta. Clearly, biomanufacturers need a more affordable option if they're ever going to bring their innovations to market. The reason why growth factors are so expensive are because of the methods used to make them. Precision fermentation uses microbes and molecular farming uses plants to express these very complex animal proteins. These methods require a lot of what's called downstream processing, referring to the purification, isolation, and refolding of the proteins. The crux of our technology at EDGE is that we have developed a methodology using animal cells that requires no downstream processing, therefore allowing us to save 60 to 90 percent of those production costs and 30% in production time. Thus, our growth factors are more affordable thanks to our lack of downstream processing and our use of non-pharmaceutical grade inputs. They're more authentic as we are providing the entirety of the biomolecules naturally expressed by animal cells rather than scrubbing them through purification. And it's easy to scale as our process is modular. One of the biomaterials that we've developed protects the cells from the shear forces in a bioreactor, resulting in higher cell yields. During the course of IndieBio, we've established that our animal cell factories do in fact uh, produce growth factors at a fraction of the cost compared to competitors. Right now, with one of our first growth factors being basic FGF, we are at a cost point of $96 per milligram, and that's expected to reach $10 next year. And we've also proven that it enhances cell growth, as we've almost doubled that of animal serum. We have a lot of products on our pipeline, but our go-to-market strategy involves supplying these three to our customers, with whom we will be developing partnerships. Those include recombinant bovine albumin, basic FGF, and a fibroblast conditioned media. And we are producing all three at a scale of one liter per day. Dermo Cosmetics, or the use of biology in the formulation of skincare cosmetics, is the fastest growing trend right now. We're working very closely with Accenture to build out this market, and they are linking us with some of their high-profile cosmetics clients. If we can supply growth factors to 10% of cosmetics manufacturers, our serviceable obtainable market is $885 million. We've built the perfect team to get this done. I am a Posse Foundation scholar with over six years of experience in product design and startups. Our CTO, Dr. Manny Tamargo, graduated from Columbia University with his PhD in tissue engineering, then worked at Helicon, a frontier biotech consulting firm working as a director where he was hired by investors very similar to yourselves to evaluate the technology of cultivated meat startups where he saw firsthand the scope of this growth factor problem that we are solving. Dr. George Stratagopoulos, our lead cell scientist, has been a researcher and professor at Columbia University for the past 18 years and has pioneering work in stem cell signaling. All of us at EDGE know that without affordable growth factors, the potential of cells to enhance our world will never be realized. So together, let's build the infrastructure for the future of biomanufacturing. Thank you. As a podcaster, I've interviewed over 35 entrepreneurs and investors in the world of cultivated meat and seafood. I have two takeaways. The first is that our industry is maturing 
We've got companies that are specializing in pieces of the tech stack, making product development faster and cheaper. And second, I met a lot of companies that were doing great stuff with pork and chicken and beef, but there is still a huge white space with seafood. My name is Doug Grant. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Atlantic Fish Co. We're using cellular agriculture to develop the world's first cultivated halibut. And we're starting with seafood because it's not an exaggeration to say the world is running out of wild-caught fish. This is going to break. We are destroying our ecosystem, and this is not our future. And the knee-jerk reaction is to say, let's double down on aquaculture. And that's worked really well for the last 30 years. But the reality is that many of the fish people love to eat don't do well in captivity. And this cohort, including halibut, flounder, snapper, and grouper, is overfished and becoming too expensive. We've segmented them as the market price fish because that's typically how we're seeing them priced on our menus. We've got about 150 companies in our industry. Only 11 are focused on seafood, and we are the only company focused on the market price fish segment. To go after this huge market opportunity, we're focused on the most expensive fish in the market price fish segment, halibut. To do this, we have exclusive access to the last farm-raised halibut in North America to develop our cell lines. Our partners in Canada are providing us with adults, juveniles, and embryos to develop these cell lines. Now this is important because many of the most well-funded companies in this space, including Upside Foods, Believer Meats, Ala Farms, they are all using embryonic cell lines for their terrestrial species. We now have this same capability with a premium wild fish species. And we're partnering with other companies doing the tech stack, including growth media, growth factors, and bioreactor scale up to leverage their technology with our cell lines. This is gonna speed our path to market, it reduces our cost, while also allows us to continue to build an IP moat around our core technology. Halibut was actually the original idea that they had with the filet of fish at McDonald's. You fast forward 30 years and now halibut is completely overfished in the Atlantic. When these fishermen in Gloucester, Massachusetts go out to fish, they can't actually go after halibut. The only way they can catch it is by bycatch when they're actually looking for lobster or something else and it's only one per trip. So just in the last you know, few decades, we've seen where we had an abundance of this fish to where it's been completely decimated on the East Coast. In the last 90 days at Indie Bio, we've made some incredible progress on cell line development. We've started with tilapia and flounders, flounder using both adults and juveniles to do a cell isolation protocol. We've also got fish cells growing in suspension. And our work culminated when just a few weeks ago, we brought a halibut from Canada down to North Carolina and have the world's first cultivated halibut cells for seafood growing in our lab. We did that in 90 days. But halibut is not the thing. It's the thing that gets us to the thing. And that's our vision of a world where animals are completely removed from the food supply system, but people still have the meat and seafood they love to eat. Thank you so much. My name is Lindsay Atkinson. I'm an associate at Indie Bio New York, and we're super excited to have everyone here today to experience our new space at Seven Penn Plaza, and really just to take the opportunity um, to discuss here on this panel the, the future of food and how we can leverage technology really to improve the way we produce, distribute, and, and consume. Um, my first question really goes to Rini. Um, traditionally, you've been a tech investor, but we have you here on the food panel. You were a major part of Harmony's um, seed round. Would love to hear more about kind of your th investment thesis in food tech. Uh, I won't tell you how long I've been investing, but there was a point in my career <laughs> where I realized that there was a gaping hole in the food system, meaning investors were investing in impact, but they were extremely focused on alternative energy and storage and EV and things that Elon Musk could do, and it was very sexy. but. 31% of greenhouse gases came from the food system and nobody was really focused on it and there was a whole host of reasons. And all of that was changing. And it was because the consumer was starting to drive a change. They are spending more of their wallet share on uh, sustainability and nutrition. 
Um, I'd love to hear actually from your perspective as CSO of Harmony, kind of um, what changes you've seen in the industry and what technologies you anticipate will kind of be the most transformative. I started in the biopharm industry almost 40 years ago. And, and way back then, we were really trying to figure out how to make money with genes. You know, um, and it, it didn't take very long to realize that pharmaceuticals was the, the, the best way to do it, um, especially back then because the technology wasn't there yet. You know, so you could make a few micrograms per, per liter of a protein, and for a very potent pharma pharmaceutical, that was enough. Um, we thought about foods ba back in those days, but, um, but the technology just wasn't there. And uh, what, what's changed is now uh, expression technologies are much more productive. Um, and you, know, you, you heard a couple j right before us um, where um, you, you know, it, new ways of doing it, uh, creative ways of doing it, where you can um, produce these proteins um, in large amounts for very, very little uh, cost of goods. So, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over. No, definitely. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to Isabella. Uh, you mentioned basically developments, you know, post indie bio on the regulatory front, IP, customer discovery. It's like so nice to see you here again at indie bio. Um, I'd love to hear more about the progress you've made since graduating, I think almost a year ago now. Um, so yeah, I think I, I kind of breezed over it before, but um, once we graduated, we raised our seed round um, quite quickly, which was which was great. I think a, a sign of the times at that moment. Um, and we then were able to bring our team back to Germany and start our R&D lab there. Um, a lot of the team is European, which is why we ended up uh, going back. Um, and so since then, we've been, um, if, oh my gosh, like so much. <laughs> we've, we've built up our entire lab. We've um, tripled our team, which meant that we also added a team uh, for product development, so really trying to focus on developing end products as early as possible, getting them into the hands of consumers and our first ty types of end clients as quickly as possible. And I think that this is a change, um, at least between Bosk and what you've seen maybe some of our competitors in the space do, where oftentimes you see products taking five to 10 years to actually get to market. And I understand why, because it's extremely difficult um, and there's a lot of R&D that goes into it. But I also think um, the times have changed and companies need to be much more focused and much quicker to market. Awesome. Well, that concludes the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>
and we are setting out to solve these most difficult, difficult problems. Thank you so much for coming uh, today.